Messier 47. What is it? Where is it? What's going on? It's an open cluster. There we go. Looks like the Pleiades. It has a certain family resemblance to it. So it's an open cluster like the Pleiades. So it's one of these sort of fairly ratty collections of stars in the plane of the Milky Way. What else can I say about it? It's quite large in that actually it's about half a degree across, which is about the same size as the full moon. The other salient point is that there are both blue stars and red stars in it. So the red stars are the ones that have kind of evolved away from their initial life on the main sequence when they're just turning hydrogen into helium to the late stages of their lives. But the blue ones are the ones that are still on the main sequence. So they're the ones that are, are still just turning hydrogen into helium. This interesting stage in that because it's got blue stars in it, you know that actually stars that are blue on the main sequence are quite massive stars. And quite massive stars have quite short lifetimes. So the fact that you see blue stars there tells you that it can't be that old. And in fact, if you go through looking in detail at the different distributions of the colours of the stars, you come to the conclusion it's about 150 million years old. It's not the youngest cluster, it's not the oldest, but it turns out it's an interesting sort of age. And the reason it's an interesting sort of age relates to this paper here. It's a massive magnetic helium atmosphere white dwarf binary in a young star cluster. And in fact, the young star cluster in question is Messier 47. So what the people who wrote this paper were trying to do is they were looking at the masses of white dwarfs. And one of the sort of unsolved questions in astronomy is how the mass of the star when it formed in the first place, how that translates into its end state, which is this white dwarf star it ends up as. We've talked about wide doors before, but basically they're the end stage of a star where the whole thing's collapsed down to about the size of the Earth, and it just basically sits there and cools down over time. It's kind of the end, end stage of a star's life. Is a star the heaviest it will ever be at the moment of its birth? Usually, is the short answer. So the main processes that stars can go through after they've been born is to lose mass. They'll shed their outer layers towards the ends of their lives. Even the sun's losing a little bit of mass at the moment through the solar wind. The odd exceptions are ones where you have a close binary star and sometimes one star will steal mass from the other star. So occasionally stars put on weight, but usually they just kind of decrease in mass. Actually, the end state for a star like the Sun is that at the, at the end of its life, it'll blow off all its outer layers in one of these things called a planetary nebula, and all that will be left will be this kind of core at the centre. But what these people were interested in is how that, the mass that the star starts with translates into the mass that the white dwarf ends up with. Um, and in particular, also, what the most massive white dwarf e that you'll ever find is. Because there's a theoretical limit, a thing called the Chandrasekhar limit, that says that actually you can't have a white dwarf more massive than about 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. So one interesting thing to do is to look at more and more massive stars to see if they end up with more and more massive white dwarfs to see how close we get to that limit and, and even if that limit's exceeded, which means that, that there'd be something wrong in the physics there. So they're looking at uh, trying to find massive white dwarfs, which means they're looking for kind of massive progenitors, the things that turn into the white dwarfs. Now, there's a, a problem with finding white dwarfs from massive progenitors in that what happens is star goes through its life, blows up as a planetary nebula, leaves a white dwarf, the white dwarf then cools down and fades away and so you can't see it anymore. So if you want to find one from a massive star, and hopefully then a massive white dwarf, that means that actually you've got to have had a, a massive star that's gone through its life, blown up as a planetary nebula, left the white dwarf behind, but the white dwarf hasn't faded so far that you can't see it anymore. That's why Messier 47 is such a good place to look, because it's a cluster that's the right kind of age in that stars which are going to turn into white dwarfs have gone through their lives and blown up, but the white dwarfs won't have had time to fade away completely. Just a quick question about the planetary nebula, which I think is one of the great misnomers in all astronomy. Can we look for those to help us? Like, do, do those things hang around, those sort of quite spectacular formations to help us find white dwarfs? Probably not long enough. You'd have to find it in a young cluster of stars and find a planetary nebula. And then, yeah, you would find a really young white dwarf at that point, but the planetary nebula doesn't last very long. So actually that will have faded away before the white dwarf fades away. So it's easier to just search for the white dwarfs rather than searching for planetary nebulae. This was considered to be a happy hunting ground for yep. recently formed white dwarfs. And they found one. They took a whole load of spectra, looked at the colors and brightnesses of different things, tried to identify where, where there was a white dwarf. The other information that they have is they've got information on the proper motions of the stars, in other words, how the stars are moving around on the sky. And so they were able to identify this object which has all the properties of a white dwarf in terms of it's got the right colours, the right brightness, the right spectrum, but it's actually moving with the cluster as well. So then they know it's a member of the cluster, which gives them that evidence they need in order to date it. 
So that's what they did. They're adding to this diagram here. This is how much mass the star had to start with. This is how much mass the star ended up with. So this is the mass of the white dwarf effectively. And the object that they've just found is that point there. So it's not the most massive white dwarf that's ever been found, but it's right up there, right? There's a couple that are more massive. And you can see that if you start with a low mass star, you end up with a low mass white dwarf. If you start with a high mass star, you end up with a high mass white dwarf. How do you know the initial mass of the star that created the white dwarf? Okay, so this is quite a clever bit. So I need to show one of the other figures. So this plot here is one of these things called a color magnitude diagram, which again, we've talked about many times, but basically it's how blue or red the object is and how bright it is. So it's faint to bright and blue to red. White dwarves are sufficiently simple objects that we actually have a pretty good idea how they behave in terms of if you know the mass of a white dwarf, for example, then that directly translates into what its radius has to be. We know how big it's going to be. So if we also knew its temperature, which is how much it effectively tells you how much light it gives out per unit surface area, and you know how big it is, that tells you how bright it is. So we know an awful lot about white dwarfs, and so we can actually, with reasonable confidence, predict basically where they will lie in this diagram, and even how, if you think about it, if you just leave it, it's going to just cool down and fade away. So these things are, are the fading curves as the white dwarfs cool. They basically follow these lines like this. Okay, so how far they are down the line tells you how long it is that they've been fading for. And then the different lines are actually for different masses of white dwarfs. Now, white dwarfs have this rather strange property that the more massive the white dwarf is, the smaller it is. And so that actually means that for a given temperature, so a given amount of light coming out per unit surface area, a more massive white dwarf, because it's smaller, will be fainter. By seeing where this object is, both in terms of its colour and its magnitude, how bright it is, we can see which, which of these lines it lies on. So that's how they know its mass is 1.06 solar masses, because it lies on the 1.06 solar mass line how far down this line it is, that tells us how long it's been fading for. And again, by looking just at the models here, they can figure out, okay, this one's been fading for 75 million years. And the cluster's 150 million years old. That means that the, the star must have ended its life 75 million years ago. Um, because, you know, 70, so you've got a star that lived for 75 million years, then it's been fading as a white dwarf for 75 million years. That gets you to the 150 million years that the cluster's age is. We know what mass of stars live for 75 million years. And the answer is a star that's about six times the mass of the sun. So from, just from this one figure, we can figure out both what mass the star had to start with and what mass it's got now. There's two other things that they've learned about it. Firstly, actually, it has a companion. It's not alone. It has an M-dwarf, so a very faint star that's in a binary system with it. The reason they know that is because there's a bit of excess light in the infrared, which could only be the case if there's a, a close companion. And that's quite exciting because one of the types of supernovae, these type 1a supernovae, are where you've got a white dwarf which is accreting material from a companion. And we don't know whether these two things are close enough together for that accretion to actually occur. But it could be later on, when this M dwarf goes through its evolutionary phases and starts losing mass itself, that the white dwarf will accrete it, and this might turn into a type 1a supernova. So it's possible this is a very early stage of a progenitor of one of these type 1a supernovae. The other thing that's weird is that when you actually look at the spectrum of this thing, so split the light up right up into the colours of the rainbow, so this is how much light there is as a function of wavelength from kind of blue light through to reddish light, and there are these dips due to absorption. This is what's called a helium white dwarf in that almost all the lines you see are due to helium. It's basically because you've exposed the kind of core of a star. Almost all that you're seeing there is the helium core of a star that's exposed. You can see that this is, this is one of those absorption lines, but actually you can see it's actually split into three. And this is a phenomenon called the Zeeman effect. So it, atoms have these kind of transitions between energy levels that lead to these absorption and emission at very specific wavelengths. If you take that atom and put it in a strong magnetic field, then actually those energy levels get split depending on which way up the atom is effectively relative to the magnetic field. And so instead of seeing a single line due to a transition between two of these uh, energy levels, everything gets split into three through this effect called the Zeeman effect. And the amount that the lines are split apart is related to how strong the magnetic field is. So we can actually measure the magnetic field in this, on the surface of this white dwarf. And it works out it's about 200 Tesla, which is huge, is the only other way to describe it. So just behind me up the hill there, we have one of the most powerful MRI machines in the country. That's a 10 Tesla magnet. And that's the kind of magnet where you don't want to be walking past it with a bunch of keys in your pocket because they'll just get kind of ripped out of your pocket, right? So that's a 10 Tesla magnet. This is 200 Tesla, which they were also excited about because actually magnet strongly magnetic white dwarves are quite rare. 
Um, and what they found is that actually this is, you know, what the, it looks like whatever processes it is that go on in a, when you start with a massive progenitor that turns into a white dwarf seems to be producing these magnetic white dwarfs. So it could be that some of the other magnetic white dwarfs that we know about were formed from massive stars and this is the kind of leftover white dwarf. It was a happy hunting ground for those astronomers, wasn't it? They got an awful lot out of this one object, yeah. yeah. All right in the 17th century or something, but you were telling me before, this is actually quite a modern piece that's been loaned to you by the, the Met Office. That's right, so this one will be from uh, the 19, 1940s, but actually um, the design has remained the same since the 19th century. 